Uh, thank you very much indeed, Valerie. Um, welcome to the Museum of London, and welcome in particular to those of you who are watching this lecture streamed online. Um, as Valerie said, this time last year, I delivered the first of three annual Gresham lectures about the government's plans to introduce online courts in England and Wales. I gave it a rather corny title. I called it Justice Online, Just as Good, uh, with a question mark. It was quite an optimistic, upbeat presentation. Well, tonight I want to take stock and uh, I want to see what's been achieved over the past year and ask whether Justice Online is getting any better. This is where we're going to start. We are going to start where I went a couple of months ago in search of a court without a courtroom. We are in British Columbia on Canada's Pacific coast and I've just arrived at Victoria, the capital, in a seaplane. It's just about half an hour from Vancouver by uh, uh, seaplane, although as I discovered my cost, uh, you can't get back when the fog comes down over continental North America. I was visiting Canada and the US to write a paper for the Legal Education Foundation. But if you're looking for the world's first online court, you won't find it here. You won't find it in the obvious place, although I did rather admire the transport service provided for people visiting the courts of Victoria as guests of Her Majesty. <laughs> British Columbia's online court doesn't have a building at all, so how do you get into it? Well, you start by talking to the government here in Victoria. Uh, when I visited uh, Victoria last December, I found officials and ministers uh, quite willing to speak to me, much more willing, in fact, than the Ministry of Justice here in London. Fortunately, things have got a little better. They did so at the end of last month. So later in this lecture, I'll be able to show you some of what's going on here. But I want to start uh, in Vancouver. This is a residential building. Uh, it's not a block of flats. It doesn't have a landlord. Instead, the apartment holders elect a committee to run the building and to look after the common parts. It's what's called a condominium. From time to time, inevitably in a shared residential accommodation, there are disputes between neighbors and they're quite difficult to resolve. In Canada, they call them strata disputes, the idea being that uh, each floor is a stratum. Uh, and uh, uh, like all disputes between neighbors, they used to be very difficult and expensive to put right. So the government of British Columbia has set up an online court to deal with disputes of this kind. It started with strata disputes. It's called the Civil Resolution Tribunal. And this is what you'll see if you look for it online. The tribunal is chaired by Shannon Salter. Her job as the CRT's first chair is a mixture of judicial, administrative and development work. And she explained the concept to me. She said, what we know is that in Canada, for every 100 people who go down to the courthouse and file a civil claim, only two of those will go to trial. But we've oriented our entire civil justice system in the common law world around the idea of a day in court that we know doesn't come 98% of the time. And we know about half of those 98% of people don't settle their claim. They just give up because they've run out of time and money and energy. So we've decided to flip that model. We assume that you're not going to have your day in court. We assume that with the right support and help, you can reach a consensual agreement. We know statistically that people are happier with agreements that they reach themselves. And also, surprisingly, that they're more likely to adhere to them. It makes sense to empower people to be active participants in their dispute resolution and leave adjudication as a last resort. Well, this is a slide used by Shannon Salter in her own presentations. Obviously, at the top of the screen, you see the symbol for the Civil Resolution Tribunal. It's part of the justice system, which means that users can complete the entire process online. And at the end, they get a tribunal order that can be enforced in the same way as a court order. 
If you look at the second line, as she says, it's the first online tribunal in Canada. There's a map of Canada there. Uh, and in fact, it's the only one of its kind in the world. And finally, it's much more accessible than a physical courtroom, particularly for people living in remote areas of British Columbia. And British Columbia's Civil Resolution Tribunal works on all types of devices, from desktops to smartphones. Darren Thompson is a lawyer working for the government of British Columbia. He is responsible for developing the tribunal, and he told me more about the thinking behind it. What he said was this. We wish you didn't have a dispute, but now you do have a dispute. What can we do to help you resolve it? You want to file your documents when you get home from work and after you put the kids to bed? Fine. You want to access our services on a cell phone from a park bench? Fine. You can do that. Darren Thompson took me through the process that a court user would follow. This is one of his slides. Um, it's a bit complicated. I don't know if you like slides like that, but I'll just take you through it. Um, you go from left to right. You start in the bottom left-hand corner um, with the problem, the diagnosis, information, self-help. You move across the screen to the right. Uh, first, you go from party to party negotiation, which is monitored. Then case management, facilitated alternative dispute resolution. Next, adjudication. And finally, post-resolution support. Uh, the big um, uh, 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 image at the top of the screen is meant to indicate that obviously fewer cases reach the end and the arrows at the bottom tell you that at the beginning the technology takes the load and the tribunal uh, take the load uh, later on in the process. Now, I'm not sure that that's terribly meaningful, so I think the best way of explaining how the thing works is to actually look at what you would see if you were actually trying to resolve a dispute in British Columbia. Now, it's all online. Anyone could try it out. Um, I did think of giving you a live demonstration, uh, but knowing that technology can go wrong, I thought the best thing to do would be to record the screens at home. So this is the first screen that you will see. Look at the top of the page, and you will see that we're invited to use what is called the Solution Explorer. Now, next to that, there are two choices, Strata and Small Claims. Um, and uh, as I've said, strata claims are disputes between neighbours, but we're going to choose small claims. So, the system is going to explore whether it can find a solution to our problem. And what's that going to be? Well, let's choose the first option here on the left there. Um, that's our problem involves buying and selling goods and services. Well, we click on that dispute and we get another screen. It asks us a question. Are we a buyer or a seller? Click the button that best describes your problem. We've decided that we're going to be a seller, a small trader who hasn't been paid. So we click goods and services, sellers, which is just somewhere around there. OK, let's move on. What do we get? Well, we get uh, a question. Um, which is going to, we're going to ask you some questions about your dispute um, and so we can give you the right information. First, what's the issue with what you sold? Let's go for the first option. Uh, we have a problem with payments or money. What's the issue with payments or money? Well, simple, the buyer hasn't paid. Fine, in that case, we may need some help. The system will generate a two-page advice document explaining why a buyer might not have paid, and more to the point, what we might be able to do about it. We can download or print it, and the tribunal wants to know what we think about it. If you look on the left, you can see a star rating there, and you can mark it out of stars, they even do half stars. Um, we can give it up to five stars, or if we like, we can click the red button and say, not helpful. Darren Thompson, who you saw earlier, he told me that uh, the responses would be collated automatically so that his colleagues could assess the system's strengths and weaknesses. They regard this user satisfaction data as their treasure trove, and they'd already begun to share some of it with academic researchers. OK, let's move on. The next question is really rather unexpected. Has the buyer started bankruptcy proceedings, it's asking us. Well, there are two problems uh, with this question. 
Um, first of all, we are not really likely to know the answer, are we? Uh, although if we say we're not sure, well, we're told where to search. Secondly, we may not really understand the question. We may think it means, is the buyer trying to make us bankrupt by not paying us? In fact, what it's trying to tell us is very good sense. It's trying to tell us that if the buyer has decided to go bankrupt, to declare bankruptcy, then we may not get our money back. Uh, well, that's very sensible, useful advice. There are more explanatory notes, but I don't find that very clear. So let's go back to the easy questions. Did we sell goods or services? We choose goods. So here's a handy guide to the Sale of Goods Act as it applies in British Columbia. That's very useful, I'm sure. Um, we can read all that. And then on to the next question. Um, what solution would you like to explore? This question has changed very slightly since I was in British Columbia in December, and I'm not so sure that they've got it right, because um, we actually want to demand the full amount that's owing to us. That's the first option on the screen. Um, but uh, we also want to make a claim with the Civil Resolution Tribunal if we don't get paid, and that's the third option, uh, and we can't choose both. Well, let's start with the first option, we want to demand our money back. Well, we can help you with that, says the system. We can write a letter that you can send to the buyer. You start by filling in your name and address and so on, and then you put in the buyer's details and the amount that's owing. And then the system generates a polite but firm letter to the buyer. It says, um, I'm willing to, uh, where's it gone? It says, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, I'm writing to report non-payment uh, of, and this is where you enter a summary of the goods or services that I sold you on a certain date. According to our agreement, payment was due as follows, and so on. You will have entered the details. Uh, to avoid further steps, please contact me uh, and uh, confirm your payment in full. And we can make this, we can change this letter, we can make it a bit more firm and a bit less polite if we think it's a good idea. Once it's ready, uh, we can download it or we can print the letter and we can send it to the buyer. Okay, well, what happens? In my example, sadly, there's no reply. So uh, we think, well, can we start legal proceedings? Not yet, because this system is designed to keep you away from the courts. It's designed for dispute resolution. It doesn't give up that easily. Here is another workbook with handy tips for negotiating a solution. Well, that didn't work either, but fortunately we've saved what we've uh, recorded so far, and we can go back a few steps, and this time we click the third option and we say we want to make a claim. Fine, says the system. Here's a summary of what you've told us so far. Your exploration found one issue, it tells us. Um, I'm afraid I don't find that very clear, because if you remember, earlier on, it used the word issue to mean problem. Now it's using issue to mean dispute, or maybe cause of action. We might think if it says it's found an issue, that it's telling us there's an error in what we've told the tribunal but that's not quite what it means. Um, I did point this out to Darren Thompson, and he promised he would have another look at it. But let's say we can understand that. Let's say we've got past that. Let's scroll down, and at the end of the page, it uh, tells us uh, how we might be able to get legal advice, maybe for a nominal fee or maybe without charge, uh, and uh, uh, off we go. And we can now lodge a formal claim with the tribunal. If our claim is worth between 3,000 and 5,000 Canadian dollars, which is currently the maximum, the tribunal fee is $125, that's just over 70 pounds. And it's only at this stage that we have to provide our name and address. I thought at this stage perhaps the tribunal might want us to upload copies of our transaction records. Well, it doesn't because it actually rather hopes still that we might be able to resolve this case uh, without actually uh, going as far as a hearing. Well, we've completed the application form. The other side's been notified. We're given another opportunity to settle our claim. If no agreement can be reached, an expert facilitator will try to mediate. But it's only if that proves impossible that preparations will be made with the facilitator's help for a legally qualified tribunal member 
to judge the dispute. So that's how it works in British Columbia. But as far as I can see here in England and Wales, although, as I shall tell you, there was some intention that something like this should be built into the system, there doesn't seem to be any sign of it yet. Now, it may well be that we don't want to follow the Canadian system in England and Wales, steering people away from a hearing before a traditional judge in a traditional courtroom is something that requires careful thought. But I think it's a debate that's going by default here. There's very little consultation, very little public discussion about what's going on here in England and Wales. I did my best to get the ball rolling when I introduced the subject here a year ago. And you can watch a video recording of my first lecture on the Gresham website, and I'm certainly not going to go through it all again now. Very briefly, though, I talked about the Crown Courts of England and Wales, the courts that try serious criminal cases, and I explained that the back offices of all these courts used to have cupboards full of files just like this. Until recently, every case dealt with by a court, criminal, civil or family, involved a folder of paper records. And that folder had to be in court every time there was a hearing so that it could be consulted and updated by the judge. So paper files had to be stored in the back office of every court where a case was to be heard. The case couldn't proceed unless the files and the judge were in the same place at the same time. If the judge wants to work on a case of an evening, a weekend to prepare, judges do actually work longer than 10.30 to 4 o'clock, you may be surprised to know. Well, if the judge wants to work uh, late at court or take home um, the file, um, that, would, that was necessary, to take home a physical file. That is no longer necessary. And now the, the trolleys that used to be needed to carry these files, I don't know what I've done there, um, that's better. Um, trolleys were needed to carry files around the building and now they're parked unwanted and unloved. Paper files have been replaced by electronic files. Inside court, jurors are still given a pencil and paper as well as a Bible on which to take the oath, but facing them across the courtroom is a large television screen on which they're shown the evidence. These screens have now been installed in 128 hearing centres. All criminal courts now have Wi-Fi available for court users. New technology has transformed the way that lawyers operate in court. This barrister makes handwritten notes on a tablet computer and then he uploads his electronic notebook onto the defendant's file on the digital case system in case it may be needed at some point in the future. The whole system can be accessed by prosecution, and defence lawyers as well as the judge, although there are private areas that can't be seen by the other side. Crucially, the police can input into this system, prosecution service as well, and I'm told that the first cases have now been progressed in this way uh, from beginning to end um, in a pilot project in Liverpool. All this is part of what's called HMCTS reform, at least I think that's what it's called. I'll tell you what HMCTS is in a moment, but it now seems to be called the HMCTS Change Programme. This is a document that I shall be looking at later on. HMCTS is Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunals Service. It runs the criminal, civil and family courts and tribunals in England and Wales. It has teams of project managers who design new computer systems uh, on a budget of one billion pounds. Now, let's look at what's happened since my last lecture on 22nd of February last year. First of all, at that time, Liz Truss was Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice. Two more Lord Chancellors have been appointed since then. On the 23rd of February, a day after my lecture, Liz Truss published her Prisons and Courts Bill. This bill was working its way quietly through Parliament until Theresa May announced that she would be calling a snap election. That was on the 18th of April. 
I speculated immediately afterwards that Liz Truss wouldn't remain Lord Chancellor if the Conservatives remained in power, and that proved to be true. Parliament was prorogued on the 27th of April last year, and the bill lapsed when Parliament was dissolved a few days later. There it is lapsing. There hadn't been time to get through the Commons, um, and uh, it uh, disappeared completely. But the Conservatives were expected to bring it back if they won the election, as they did just. However, the Queen's speech was delayed until the 21st of June, while Theresa May tried to form a government. When it came, the government promised that legislation would be introduced to modernise the court system. Background notes issued by the government referred specifically to a court's bill. Eight months on, there is still no sign of that bill. But why does that matter? Why is legislation so important? I want to show you a document laid before Parliament by senior judges. Obviously, you can't read that on the screen there, but I'll show you one or two of the sentences in it. This is a document that was published on the 19th of April last year. You'll see that it was written by the then Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas of Coombe Gyeth, and the senior tribunals judge, Sir Ernest Ryder. They supported the clauses dealing with the courts and tribunals because of what the judges said was their critical importance to the reform, modernisation and effectiveness of the delivery of justice. The judges explained that a major process of reform was underway, but they said the legislation being considered by Parliament was essential if the reforms were to be delivered successfully. Without the proposed legislation, the judges explained, some of the reforms will not be possible and the programme as a whole might not be deliverable. It was almost as if they thought that something might go wrong. The two judges said it was essential to have a new online procedure rule committee if the system that was being designed was to operate to its full potential. And what's an online procedure rule committee? It's simply a committee that is making rules for online procedures. Let me explain. At the moment, you have got courts which operate very formal procedures. Lawyers stand up when they address the judge. And you have tribunals which are very informal. You address them sitting down. They have different histories, different procedures, and different rule books. The new rules would be made, that would be made by this committee would apply to both courts and tribunals. This was clause 37 of that bill, the one that lapsed, the Prisons and Courts Bill, uh, that was introduced last year. Look at what it says. There are to be rules of court and tribunal procedure rules which must require specify proceedings to be initiated by electronic means. This was our first sight of the online court. The Rules Committee was required to make sure that its rules were simply expressed, both simple and simply expressed. Its practice and procedure had to be accessible and fair so that disputes could be resolved quickly and the rules needed to support innovative methods of resolving disputes. Well, that's all very good stuff. But none of that has happened. The courts look pretty much like Bow Street did during the suffragette disturbances more than a century ago, except that many London courts have now been closed off and closed down and sold off to raise money to uh, contribute to this £1 billion fund, uh, this court, Bow Street, has been empty for years. The word on the street is that there are plans to bring back the court's clauses of the Prisons and Courts Bill in two stages. First, there will be a bill dealing with the criminal courts, and we can expect that to be published at around Easter. And later this year, we can expect to be seeing a separate bill setting up a rule committee for the civil courts. It's expected that the new bill will be identical to the legislation that was introduced last year and abandoned, but that's not been confirmed by the government, nor have these dates. And even if everything goes according to plan, well, the reforms will be delayed for 
more than a year. So how far has the government got in its plans to clean up justice? You won't be surprised to know that their approach uh, uh, to health and safety has been rather tightened up since this picture was taken at the Old Bailey in the 1930s. But let me tell you about a number of initiatives that are already being tested using real claimants. The first is called the Single Justice Procedure. I'll be telling you in a bit of detail about all of these in a moment, but let's just list them. Um, then we get to online traffic, please. Divorce online online probate, and civil money claims. Well, let's start with the first of those, the single justice procedure. This is a court, but not as we know it. Uh, the lay magistrate is a lady called Anne Flintham, and she's sitting with Andrew Nicholson, Deputy Justice's Clerk for South West London. They're a court, they're part of Lavender Hill Magistrates Court, and they're dealing with fair evasion cases in which the defendant has pleaded guilty or not responded to a summons. The prosecutor and defendant don't have to attend, and I'm not quite sure what would happen if I asked to go and uh, observe that court too. Uh, but HMCTS, the court service, are very pleased with this because in the past, files had to be delivered to this court by Transport for London in a taxi. Obviously, they didn't want to wait for a bus. Um, but now the defendant's details are sent electronically, and more than 3,000 people were convicted using this scheme last year. This is the make a plea service. You use it to plead guilty or not guilty to traffic offences. It's live, it's available in all 44 police force areas. Around 1,500 people use it every week. Katie Dean, the service manager working for HMCTS, explained how easy it was for them to respond to any problems in the wording of these pages. For example, users had been confused by the question, do you want to come to court to plead guilty? They said yes, even though they didn't want a hearing. So the question was changed. We're no longer stuck with a system that we have to work with, she said, which makes for a much simpler customer journey. Susan Ackland Hood, chief executive of HMCTS, told the Bar Conference last year that make a plea was going well. If you look carefully at the slide, you can see that she has displayed some user comments. I'll just read you one or two. First one is, um, I love this online service. It's so amazing and time-saving. Next one, perfect. If only all government and other services work like this. And finally, this comment, um, which I must say seems rather implausible coming from someone charged with a traffic offence. I find the ability to make a plea online particularly useful for me as I'm homebound. <laughs> but it's not just traffic. The online divorce service is currently being tested in four areas of the country. This is what you would have seen last summer when the system was first launched using real claimants. Note it says fill in online, print and post. That was an interim arrangement because this is how it looks now. Uh, you no longer have to print and post and there are plans to introduce this system nationally this summer. So you log on, rather like the Civil Resolution Tribunal from Canada that I showed you earlier, and it asks you a series of questions. Has your marriage irretrievably broken down, meaning it can't be saved? Well, we'll say yes to that. Who are you divorcing? Two choices. Um, I'm going to divorce my wife. Um, I make sure that I don't tick the wording at the bottom of the page we were a same-sex couple when we got married. Okay, we must continue. Um, when did you get married? Um, you must say it was more than two years ago, otherwise the system will tell you you're not entitled to a divorce, which is fine. Check if you can get a divorce in England or Wales. You must have some connection to England or Wales for the court to have the jurisdiction to grant you a divorce. Is your life mainly based in England or Wales. This may include working, owning property, having children in school, and your main family life taking place in England or Wales. Yep, that's all fine. Um, but the real problems start when people are asked to set out the facts that they are relying on in support of a divorce. This is another page from last year. Now, remember, I have already ticked the box to say I am divorcing my wife. What's my reason for doing so? 
Um, look at adultery in the middle of the screen. I'll make it a bit bigger for you so that you can read it more clearly. Adultery. Your wife has committed adultery with a man and you find it intolerable or unbearable to live with them. I hear you laugh. Um, um, it, um, it is actually rather amusing because nobody would be surprised if a husband found it intolerable to live with his wife and her lover. But that's not something the courts need to know. What the question is trying to find out is whether a wife had committed adultery and a husband found it intolerable to live with her. Um, a similar insistence on unnecessary gender-neutral language makes it much harder to understand the guidance at the foot of the page. It says, your, your wife must give their consent to a divorce for you to use this fact. If they don't, your application will be rejected. Who are they? I'm told that this um, language was the result of user testing. I was very pleased to hear this, but I don't believe it. Have you ever heard a husband referring to his wife as them in conversation? My wife's called Melanie. I asked them if they wanted a cup of tea. They told me to wait until they'd finished the shower. Is that English? Um, the wording has changed, um, but not very much. Um, this is the current page. It no longer says your wife has committed adultery with a man. Instead, it says you can only use adultery if it was with a member of the opposite sex, which I think is really quite hard for people to understand. <laughs> Crucially, it still says that your wife has committed adultery and you find it intolerable to live with them. And this must refer to your wife and her lover. If it means intolerable to live with her, why doesn't it say so? Okay, dividing your money and property, um, this is fine. Um, if you agree to split your money and property and you want to make it legally binding, that's fine, you can do that. Um, this is good, this is where you can upload your documents. Um, you can upload a digital scan of your marriage certificate or other documents that you want the court to see, that's fine. And uh, finally, you have a chance to correct any mistakes, mistakes you've made, that is. Um, and um, that's as far as we can go with online divorce at the moment. Most people who want to get divorced won't see that. What they'll see is a paper form, although it's one that you can actually fill out on a computer and print it off. This is uh, a version issued last August, um, and it's, it's quite a good system. Under the, um, this is how it works. Under the old paper-based system, HMCTS, say, 40% of divorce forms have basic errors, and we had to send them back. Uh, and the, the new system that will replace this is rather better. You can't yet pay your fees online if you're using the paper form, but the court will happily phone you back and take £550 off your credit card, uh, which is more than twice as much as it costs the court service to provide the service of a divorce. But that's not the fault of HMCTS, that's the fault of the government. The form is quite well laid out. It has uh, notes in the margin that helps you fill it in. So that's the uh, divorce system and that's probably enough about divorce. Let's move on to probate, which means proving the will of somebody who has died. Uh, unless the estate is quite small, executors need to obtain probate before they can sell the deceased property and distribute the assets. Uh, for the moment, the probate service is accepting online applications in simple cases. If you meet the criteria, you can call the helpline and ask to take part in one of the pilots. And so far, around a thousand applications have been received. Most applicants still have to fill in um, the effectively a paper form online, print it off, and arrange for it to be sworn in accordance with long-standing arrangements. But the new online probate service provides um, a new statement of truth for the executor to fill in and declare that the uh, document that they're uh, filling in is correct, and that removes the need to swear an oath in person. It, it allows arrangements to pay the fee online, so there's no need to um, post a check or give them your credit card uh, when they phone you back. And there's a save and return function that allows you to revisit an application if you need further information. Well, that's all fine. Now, this is from the HMCTS briefing document I referred to earlier. Again, I don't think you'll be able to read the words, but you only have to read this blue sticker, which is on the original 
um, that uh, I, I was uh, shown by HMCTS. It says, people are applying for probate online with grants of probate often on the day. Well, if that means that probate is actually granted on the day that you upload your death certificate and the original will, then it must raise questions about how effectively the system actually verifies and checks your information and these documents. After all, that is what probate means. So maybe I've misunderstood that. Maybe on the day it refers to something else. The fourth example in my list of five is small claims. In this case, civil money claims. Um, these are very important. This page, um, if you look closely, says Alpha in the corner there. So it was a very early internal design and it was not used for public beta testing. This is how the same page looks now. It's certainly an improvement. But what I am really concerned about is the lack of information that we, the public, have about how well this pilot project is going. I was given some figures by HMCTS at the end of last month. Apparently 1,686 users have been recruited for the pilot project and of these uh, 998 have issued claims, that's 59%. It follows that 688 did not, that's 41%. And why did these 41% decide not to go ahead with the claims, having already um, checked in with the online service? We have no idea. Um, that's the problem. And yet, as far as we can see, HMCTS is pushing ahead with the whole system. Back to the claim form. This is where you fill in details of the amount you're claiming. Now, it may seem perfectly logical for HMCTS to begin this form and these forms with these questions. What are you claiming? What are you claiming for? Who are you claiming against? And so on. If you were designing a system, that's probably where you would begin. But let's look back to what the Civil Justice Council said uh, in its report a couple of years ago. Civil Justice Council is an advisory body established under an Act of Parliament to keep the civil justice system under review and advise on how it should be improved. And in April of 2014, it set up an advisory group to look at online disputes. It was chaired by Professor Richard Susskind, who, as many as you know, is the leading expert on this. He did decision trees for his uh, PhD thesis. He knows a great deal about this. This was a report that called for a new internet-based court service to be known as Her Majesty's Online Court, and it would have three tiers. Tier one would help users to evaluate their grievances and maybe enable disputes to be resolved by the parties themselves. Tier two would, it be, uh, would involve online facilitators who could help the parties by mediating, advising or encouraging them to negotiate. And tier three would bring in full-time or part-time members of the judiciary to resolve disputes on the basis of documents submitted to them electronically, although in most cases wouldn't reach that stage. Now that must sound familiar to you. It's very much what we saw is happening at the moment in British Columbia. Now, perhaps rather counterintuitively, the advisory group recommended that stage three of the online court, the judgment stage, should be delivered first. One reason for this is that allowing judges to decide cases without a traditional hearing would immediately relieve pressure on the system. Another is that it would be easier to design and implement stage three than the other two stages. And Professor Suskin's advisory group argued that stage three should be followed by stage two, a mix of conciliation and case management, and then by stage one, which is the decision tree process, a decision tree being a series of questions and answers, and each time you answer a question, it asks you another question, and it all spreads out like the branches of a tree. And this approach seemed very wise to me, but as far as I can see, it's not being followed by HMCTS. If it is, they haven't told me. Let's go back to um, the introductory pages of this maker money claim. I'm afraid, again, I don't want to be too fussy, but I just don't like this wording at all. Look at what it says. It starts helpfully enough. A money claim might not be your only or best option. Find out about other ways to get money. But then the language becomes slightly demotic. You might have to go to a hearing in front of a judge if the person says they don't owe you. It also seems to be putting you under a lot of pressure to settle. It can take up to seven months to get a hearing date. Why should it take so long? 
What kind of a service is that? Well, maybe it doesn't take that long because this is the briefing note that I showed you, the one I received from HMCTS. And um, look at this. It says, um, from claiming to getting a hearing date, now it takes around two weeks. So maybe you're told in two weeks that the hearing will be in seven months. It's all a bit confusing. And remember the thinking behind the British Columbia system that 98% of cases are not going to come to court and it's so it's best to try and resolve them. Isn't that something that we should be considering here as the advisory group, the one that's chaired by Richard Susskind, recommended? Do we really want to replicate the existing system online? I asked HMCTS about this the other day and they said it wasn't their job to encourage litigants in uh, court to behave in any particular way but I think it's certainly something we should be discussing. And there are other problems with the design of the uh, online pages or the screens um, used in England or Wales. I wonder if any of you have spotted them. At first sight, the ones used here look remarkably similar to the ones used in British Columbia. Same layout, same design, same font, even the same colors. But there's a subtle difference. If you look, the British Columbia page as the province's logo over there. And um, the one used here says Gov UK. Any problems with that? Well, what if you're bringing a claim against the government for unpaid benefits, perhaps, or tax appeal? Would you really want to use a court run by the government of the United Kingdom? Surely the courts are meant to be independent of the government. It's a battle the UK Supreme Court fought for years, and that was just about the website address. In my view, these pages should no longer be branded Gov UK. It would be much better if they carried the name of the online court. But there's a problem with that. Um, nobody's quite sure what they're going to call it. I think problems like this could be resolved much more quickly if HMCTS had been willing to talk to outsiders, people like Professor Dame Hazel Genn, founder and director of the Judicial Institute at University College London and the UK's leading authority on socio-legal studies. Delivering the Birkenhead Lecture at Gray's Inn last year, she said of the reforms that were then underway, there's clearly a great deal of activity, but it's not easy to say on any one day exactly what's happening and how far any particular part of the programme has progressed. The only regular source of updates is the Inside HMCTS blog. The lack of a clear flow of communication has been a cause of some complaint among the profession, the judiciary and academics. In support of this claim, Hazel Gen cited comments made by Susan Ackland Hood, the chief executive of HMCTS. And this is what she wrote, Susan Ackland Hood, in a blog last September. I'll start at the second sentence there. One of my main reflections is we've not talked widely enough yet about our reform plans, but more importantly, I don't think we've listened enough or given enough ways for people who care about the system and how it works to help shape its improvement. I'd like to change that. Well, it is changing at last, and Hazel Genn and I have found it a bit more easy to talk to HMCTS, and they were a bit more willing to talk to us, but in my view, it's still not changing quickly enough. I think that HMCTS is still not receptive to people who care about the system, which is what I would include myself in. And here's someone who cares so much about the system that he's actually on the board of HMCTS. Um, this is the senior tribunals judge, Sir Ernest Ryder, who also sits in the Court of Appeal. Earlier this month, he gave a speech in Luxembourg about open justice. Our digital courts must be open courts, he said. He insisted that judges must be involved in reform. He suggested non-executive directors to support judicial governance, more training for judges in management skills, more transparency, more accountability. And then he said this. We're now in a new digital world. In order to understand, to design and to test reform, we must, it seems to me, engage far more than we have in the past with academia, with management experts, digital experts, with professions, regulators, ombuds and wider society. Reform must be based on proper research, robust and tested. It must be open to scrutiny and communicated clearly and readily. It must require us to consider whether our processes are sufficient to meet modern conditions. Are you listening, HMCTS? 
Last Thursday, HMCTS announced the first tax appeals to be heard through video hearings. This will happen in the spring. They say that video technology is already used in criminal courts to allow some victims and witnesses to give evidence, and the pilot scheme is taking this a stage further, with all parties, including the judge, participating in the hearing via video technology. Making use of technology to hold video hearings for technical parts of cases that mainly involve legal professionals and judges could save the court time and help progress cases faster, the announcement says. Well, hang on, says Roger Smith, the experienced legal commentator. He says, as a member of the public, I have a right, and as a journalist, I may have a need to actually see those parts of a court case. It might be a good idea to highlight the difference between vulnerable witnesses and confident legal professionals, rather than to make what he calls a facile elision between two different types of video. It would, at the very least, increase confidence in HMCTS's constitutional understanding. That was Professor Roger Smith, who uh, is former director of the Legal Action Group and uh, practicing a former practicing solicitor, now non-practicing. We're told that everyone involved in this particular pilot will use a webcam from a location of their choice. And uh, for the pilot, the judge will be in a courtroom. HMCTS said they were working closely with the judiciary to make sure that the majesty of a physical courtroom will be upheld. But video has problems. A survey conducted by the campaign group Transform Justice last year suggested that most people thought appearing on video made it more difficult to understand what was going on. Penelope Gibbs, its director, called for a full evaluation of outcomes in the pilot so we know whether virtual hearings help or hinder access to justice. She has pointed out that although there is currently a consultation on court closures, it doesn't deal with specifically with online court processes and virtual courtrooms. There's no equality aspect uh, assessment, no equality impact assessment, which is needed because video links are likely to cause particular difficulties for certain people, people with mental health problems, learning difficulties, or English as a second language. The Law Society, which of course represents solicitors in England and Wales, said that people lodging tax appeals were likely to be well-educated and not financially or technologically excluded. But what happens when we extend this online video system to people who are? And what about media access? I emailed my contacts at HMCTS last Thursday and the MOJ to ask uh, what uh, arrangements were going to be made for the press in these online video courts. There was no reply that day, but I started a conversation on Twitter and I got a very rapid response. HMCTS said that for the pilot, the judge would sit in a traditional courtroom, allowing observers to attend as they can now, which is fine for the pilot, but what happens when the judge is on a video link too? Well, I was hoping that Susan Ackland Hood, the chief executive of HMCTS, might deal with that point in a blog that she published last Thursday. There was talk last year of allowing special booths for people to watch online hearings in court buildings, but there was nothing in her statement about that. Instead, she said that video hearings will not be used for non-summary criminal trials, which I think is lawyer speak for that uh, they will be used in the magistrates' courts. And she said they'll be particularly appropriate for progress hearings, which principally involve legal professionals. Um, but that's fine as long as the press and public can get access to hearings at, that are currently in open court. And it's fine as long as the technology works smoothly. Sometimes, as you've seen from my presentation all these deliberate mistakes I just put in, just so that you would see the point I'm making. Sometimes technology doesn't quite work smoothly as it should. This is John Warboys, who was brought to 
High Court two weeks ago, I think from a prison in Yorkshire, quite a long journey. The reason uh, for that is the Sir Brian Levison, the judge who's hearing a challenge to the parole board's decision to release him, said that he needed to follow the proceedings. Well, why couldn't he just be produced on a video link as normal? Because the system had repeatedly broken down the day before and Levison simply couldn't trust it to work. On that occasion, the day before, he'd had to move from one courtroom to another, which suggests to me that the fault was at the end of the courts rather than at the prison end. And if HMCTS can't make links work to the High Court and the Court of Appeal, what hope is there for virtual hearings in the lower courts? And with the court's bill delayed for more than a year, when will we see the savings and improvements promised by HMCTS? And how will we know if they're improvements if we don't see any research findings? Roger Smith, who I quoted earlier, called yesterday for an independent evaluation committee of experts who are willing to keep up to date with these uh, fast-moving programs to flag up unwarranted constitutional infractions and unjustified expenditure. He said that shouldn't hinder the agility of HMCTS, but it may well improve the quality of its product. Sounds like an excellent idea to me. So, back to the question I asked at the outset. At the outset, justice online getting better? Well, on that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the jury is still out. I hope to be back here in a year's time to let you have my verdict. In the meantime, you'll find a handout to collect on your way out, and if there's not enough in, in that, you can buy a much longer version of this saga uh, as a download from Amazon. We have about uh, five minutes left, perhaps slightly longer, and in that uh, period of time, I'm very happy to answer your questions.